playing for, you know, where shots cost five and ten thousand dollars a shot now, coming down the stretch. So it is, it's just the pressure of doing it right when the pressure, when it's on. And that's the joy, and that's the high of golf, of knowing, defining the challenge, and then doing it exactly right. By 1984, Golf Digest called him the next player to look out for. Jim Nelford had the skill set and right attitude to become an elite PGA Tour professional. What he didn't have was that all-important first victory. And as far as winning uh, your first event, it's huge. It gives you that, it, it gives you the confidence that you can do it. The membership of a, of a tour winner is, is you can always have that and always and it can, it's always something very important for, for your belief in who you are. It's been what you've been working for your whole life. Pebble Beach, it was the Crosby at the time, was always one of the major tournaments. And Jim came and played terrific. He shot four under par the last day, 68. He was waiting behind the 18th green and there was only one man with any chance to catch him and that was Hale Irwin. And you got this feeling that, yeah, it was all done and, and essentially when Hale Irwin uh, got onto that tee, um, you know, the ball went out and you can remember the commentators talking about the ball popping out. And I saw it soaring out towards, the, you know, in, into the Pacific and um, if it had stayed there, his nearest relief would have been Hawaii. And uh, you could see Irwin swearing uh, back on the tee, he was so annoyed because he knew the tournament was over, Jim had won, he had no chance. It's one of those things, you know, the ball was going, Hale Irwin's was going left into the ocean and, and, and the golf gods looked down and bling, back into the fairway. And Irwin then suddenly, you know, he got the greatest break of his life and uh, he's walking down the fairway and he's talking to whatever deity he believes in and he's saying, forgive me, forgive me, I wasn't so mad as I, that's what he, he said. And uh, he went ahead and he birdied the hole. Stunned, Nelford regrouped, and on the second playoff hole, was in position to win again. Sun is right in your eyes on the 16th hole, and he takes three wood and hits it fat, and Sky pops it up there, and he's going, where to go, where to go, and he is just choking. He was in the middle of this large bunker that nobody ever hits it in, ever. Well, he whips a two iron out of there, bounces out of the high rough in front of the green, and it starts rolling back towards the hole. And from where I am, which is almost halfway from where he is to the hole, I'm watching the thing, oh my God, it's going in the hole. This is impossible, this is not happening. It goes right by the hole about eight feet. And I, I, oh boy, miss my putt and he makes his. And Irwin wins, and uh, that's golf. And really, it shaped Jim Nelfer's whole life because if he had gone on to win that tournament, which he flatly deserved to win, uh, then his whole career might have taken off. The heartbreaking loss added to an emotionally difficult time for Jim. The rigors of tour life caused his first marriage to fall apart. Then on September 8, 1985, under a golden Arizona sky, his career and life were put in serious jeopardy. At a lake just outside of Scottsdale, Saguaro Lake, and uh, water skiing with a friend and uh, a guy that I'd known for about six months. I had fallen and uh, he'd come around to pick me up. Somehow it, the, the driver apparently um, hit the gas instead of the breaker, didn't slow up and the boat was coming right at Jim. And I tried to get to either side of the hull to push off as hard as I could just to see if I you know, could get out of the way because I knew I was in a world of hurt. But of course he had the belt on to keep him from going too deep and he, he bobbed up as the props come by so he put his arm up and it just chopped, 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 chopped all the way up his arm, split him around the back, got his leg deep. And the next thing I remember is, is this arm flopped up over my shoulder when I came back out and it was cut from almost my wrist past my elbow. I couldn't feel my, my fingers on my right hand. I, I thought I'd lost fingers. It, exploded my right elbow. I thought, oh, that's it, I'm, I'm done. And this girl got on the phone and she said, Barry ran over Jim with the boat. Well, I thought they'd cut his head off and I fainted. Walked into the hospital room in, in Arizona and in Phoenix and uh, they were changing the bandage on his arm. And I'm not particularly squeamish, but I had to walk out of the room. That was tough. It's a world of pain. It's a world of pain. I remember going to him in his bed and we, we held each other and we cried. And um, 
it was, um, you know, it was, it was just, it was, a, it was a nightmare. At that point, I, I guess uh, there was a real decision of whether they had to take the arm off or not. And my mother had come down, and uh, her knowing me that well, she said, "Look, if you take his arm off, you might as well kill him." I didn't think that it was possible for any human being to come back from the accident that he had. But the one thing you knew about Jim was that, that he, was, uh, he was a tough guy, he was a battler, and, and you know, he was, if there was a way to get through it, he would, he would find it. I mean, they did about as good as they could do, um, but they told me I would never play golf again. When they told me that, uh, it was everything I could do to not tell the guy to F off. Don't say that to me, don't, you know, don't do that to, don't take away my hope. You know, all I had left at that point was hope. One day his friend Dick Zokel, a professional golfer from Canada, was down in uh, playing the Phoenix Open and called up Jim and said, hey Jim, let's go out and hit a few balls. It was just a miracle that he could swing a club. And, um, and, uh, and I remember those days when he hit his first golf ball. And um, it was phenomenal. It was just, it was exhilarating. I remember hitting uh, a nine iron that, uh, and I aimed and added a flag and one bounced into the flag. I said, all right. That's good. We, 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 some part of me still knows how to play. His attitude was tremendous. I remember him saying to me that there hasn't been a Ben Hogan story in a while. Uh, Hogan, of course, was injured in, um, in, the, uh, in 1949, I believe it was, and almost lost his life and came back to win major championships after a tremendous recovery. And Jim took that uh, as a bit of an of, of a encouragement. There are a lot of people that have it a lot worse off than I do, and they. You know, a lot of people do amazing things, come back. That's one thing that I learned so much about was how bad some people get injured. And, and you know, the road's maybe a long road coming back, but there's a way back. Jim Nelford found that way, and it would lead to another shot on the PGA Tour. Looking back at it, I just shake my head now and go, how did you do that? But never had the golfer found it so difficult to remain competitive. The toughest thing I think maybe for Jim was to kind of realize, as it is for any athlete, to realize that your day is done and, and fortunately for Jim it came way too early.